think Floodlight, I think as of two days ago or so, it hit 4,500 downloads. And for us, I mean, if you think about it... 4,500 lifetime? Uh, well, since January. I mean, we just launched it. Yeah, yeah. So, if you think there are 22,000 CCIEs out in the world. Yeah. And, I mean, something I think about a lot is, okay, how, how is a startup surrounded by, you know, by the networking alternatives to Cisco, effectively? Well, yeah. I mean, those are the groups of people that we partner with. Yeah. You know, how are we going to get out in the world with 22,000 CCIEs out there? Yeah. Um, Floodlight's been downloaded 4,500 or 4,200 times in you know, just the first five months. Yeah, it kind of starts to look like an answer. With all this interest, media hype, mm -hmm. and otherwise, uh, from a sales and marketing perspective, how do you deal with that? Because there's probably more interest than you have resources to deal with now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at this point, you know, last year, last year, OpenFlow and SDN was. You know, there were a lot of people saying, "Oh, wow, this is interesting." Yeah. Huh. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'd read a white paper every once in a while. Yeah. I mean, this year, most meetings that I go to, people want to talk about when can I trial. You know, when can I trial? What can I do? Hey, I, you know, I've kind of, I believe in this sort of 200 VMs per rack to 2,000 VMs per rack vision. I believe that the network is in my way. You know, I believe that I need to do something about it. When can we start a trial? It's a beautiful time in a startup, or to be honest, it's purely just work headcount limited. Uh, we put together, we put a plan in front of our board. You know, January, I guess, of this year, saying we have these really aggressive plans. We want to double the size of the company in the next 12 months. And we came back three months later and said, uh, actually, we kind of want to triple the size of the company in the next 12 months. And when you're talking about uh, that type of rapid growth, you mentioned you know, the strong engineering base. Is it across everything, or is it just more engineers? Across everything. I mean, at this point, it's you know, at this point, it's across everything. We basically just launched a we just launched our release that we went into private beta late last year. And we just launched our release that, you know, I think is basically our kind of public beta, give or take. Uh, so we now, I think, have a very clear path to exactly when we're going to be launching the product. Now, just so that I'm clear, when I think uh, Floodlight, Floodlight is Apache 2.0 license, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, which means it's commercial friendly. very commercial friendly, easy for you to overlay on top. Yeah. Is the model then some sort of standard Apache open core model where you've got the core open source project and you have management overlay on top or That's something exactly else? It. That's exactly it. Floodlight's probably about... Uh, 20% of our code, something like that. Uh, it's a very, very useful and it's a very high performant 20%, but there are an awful lot of other pieces in the base controller, and then it's the applications on top that we think are really interesting. If, yeah, I don't know, I should have paper, but we think about these, we think about these SDN architectures as, as three tiers. Yeah. So there's the, there's the, there's the data plane tier. Sure. Which is physical switches and hypervisor yeah. switches. And the combination of both of those two is really, really, really important. Right, so both the hypervisor and the physical switches in the data plane. There's the controller tier, which you know everybody makes a big deal out of, but our view is that's that's really just an SDK. If you buy the controller, you should yeah. bring developers. Yeah. And then there's a series of applications on top. So we're writing applications, we have partners writing applications, my first two customers wrote their own applications. Uh, and that's I think where the, a lot of the really, really interesting stuff is. So Floodlight itself is actually an open source, it's a it's a version of the controller. It's sort of a subset of the controller. And then we package it up with, I think we open sourced four of the apps on top, something like that. The fairly small ones that are more examples than anything else. Good. Um, and then in terms of the route to commercialization, you, you mentioned all these things on top. Is hardware part of that, or is it just the software only? So we, uh, about 20% of our engineering team at this point actually does engineering in the data plane. But none of those products come out under our brand. Those are all partners. So we're a very partner-driven, partner-heavy company. Uh, so we entirely partner in the data plane. We don't do any of our own. You know, we don't brand any of the products there. Uh, so all the work that we're doing is the controller and the application layer. So today, even in pilot mode, if I had a decent-sized network and I wanted uh, to engage with you on a commercial level, what would I be acquiring? So we'd assume that you either have, either already have, or we can help you get uh, OpenFlow enabled in the OpenFlow enabled data plan. Uh, either hypervisor switches or physical switches or both. Yeah. We have kind of all three models. Um, and then we'd work with you on the controller plan and on the applications that you want. Good. Um, and, and now I know this is uh, you know beta based on floodlight, etc. Um, when is this generally available? Is there a, a route to market that you're looking at right now? The you know, since we're since we're partner heavy on the data plane, yeah. we kind of need to you know, 
launching a controller and a bunch of apps with no data plane isn't terribly useful. Sure, sure. Um, launching a whole bunch of switches and hypervisor switches with no controller and apps isn't terribly useful. So we have a bit yeah. of a herd the cats game. Um, but effectively, it's going to wind up being over the summer. Good. Uh, makes sense. And, and then certainly I know lots of interest in SDN here, but uh, big vendors, whether it's you know Cisco or even Juniper with their uh, Pulse and other kinds of things where they kind of sort of try and program on top of Junos, sure. is that something where you kind of sort of maybe see some sort of competitive threat or is that completely and totally different from your perspective? The You know, it's more synergistic than competitive. I, I, I like the, there's this sort of triangle that I draw sometimes. Yeah. Uh, in a reasonable sized data center, if you're doing operations per packet, then you need to be able to do those operations a few trillion times per second. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to insert a new if-then statement somewhere. If you need to do that on per packet basis, right? you need to be thinking about a product that can do a few trillion operations per second. And so there's plenty of networking hardware out there that does exactly that. Yeah. There's an awful lot of, I think, kind of networking APIs that are built at human speeds. Yeah. So they kind of think about, all right, we need to do a few operations per second. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Sure. And that's what I think most of the APIs out there, most of the older, you know, two, yeah. three, four-year-old networking APIs out there do. I think the argument of OpenFlow, and to me, the new, new thing with SDN, is that there's all these operations in the middle that in a data center, you probably need to run a few hundred to a few tens of thousands of times per second. Yeah. So they're not really ASIC speeds. I mean, a few, you know, tens of thousands of operations per second is, you know, you don't really need a custom ASIC to do that. Okay. They're kind of more like soft, but they're not really human speeds. They're sort of in the middle. They're kind of just enterprise software speeds. Okay. And so that, I think, OpenFlow is sort of opening up this whole set of operations that can be done a few thousand to a few tens of thousand times per data center per second. Yeah. Um, that's where life gets really, really, really interesting. And now I know uh, software-defined networking, for better or for worse, is tightly coupled with uh, OpenFlow as a protocol, because uh, that's the poster child, as it were. Uh, when you think what you need to have at Big Switch is OpenFlow enough, or is there something else beyond OpenFlow as a physical technology, physical as actual coding technology that you really need? It's a really good question. Uh, so I think the if I look at the, I think OpenFlow is kind of the new new thing. Sure. Right. It lets us actually write products in the sort of middle enterprise layer that don't that don't operate at packet yeah. speed, that don't operate at human speed, operate little we can too. But if we look at the problems that we're trying to solve, it's kind of it's almost sort of a historical accident, I think, that, that this kind of new way of building networking equipment yeah. is happening at the same time that customers are facing this journey from, hey, I really understand how to do 20 servers per rack. My networking design kind of still works at 200 server, 200 VMs per rack. My networking design completely breaks down at 2,000 VMs per rack. So that kind of problem is happening at the same time that we have this new way of building networking equipment. And when we look at, okay, can we take this new thing called OpenFlow, can we apply it to this new problem that's showing up? The answer is that you need OpenFlow plus a few pieces. I was on a panel talk where I said, hey, here are like the six technical problems that need to be solved. Yeah. Uh, and it's a few bits and pieces around OpenFlow, but it's not, it's not gargantuan amounts. It's how do we do OpenFlow-based overlay networks? How do we do OpenFlow hybrid networks? Uh, how do we do OpenFlow native networks, and what are some of the other problems that follow along with those? Now, when you talk about all that, is there um, a challenge for interoperability, or is interoperability not a challenge because OpenFlow is that lowest level common denominator? I'd say it was a huge problem, and that's a lot of what led us to open source the core. Yeah. As soon as we open source the core controller, then suddenly, I have a great, uh, a great example. So last year, before we did the open source, we were setting up this interoperability test. I literally counted 600 emails that it took. 600 emails that it took to get all the legal stuff in place, to get all the engineering scheduling lined up, to actually do the test, to do huh. the write-ups around the test, and all the other yeah. crap that comes up with it. Uh, now our norm with, now that Floodlight's out there, we kind of show up and most of the interoperability test is done. And somebody downloaded it, started fooling around with it, and yeah. actually just interoperability tested it with something else they were working on. Yeah. So, let's say there were another... 10 products where we just got interoperability for free over last month. That's like 6,000 emails that just never needed to happen. Uh, I think basically because of the open source, we just get a huge boon for free. And if it works with the open source, then 99.99999% chance it works with a commercial controller as well. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you were uh, brought to open source as opposed to you know something you, you thought of as the idea in the beginning. Is that the right way of thinking of it? Very much so. Very, very much so. 
from a, a, a development perspective, are you guys using internally open source tools, whether it's Eclipse or whatever it might be to, to build? Is that part of your development environment yeah. overall? Uh, heavy Eclipse users or our tool chain actually. Um, I mean, we like to think of our tool chain looks a lot more like, it doesn't look much like a dev bench from back at Cisco. Um, it looks a lot more like a dev bench from guys over Google. Yeah. Um, it's just sort of the set of tools that we're using underneath. Yeah. It's a set of database technologies that we're using underneath. It's a set of build tools that we're using. Yeah. Um, even little stuff like, you know, real time like full automated regression testing, right? That we're sure. just kind of constantly running. So the tool chain doesn't look like a networking company. Good. Uh, that makes good sense. Um, and then from a competitive perspective, because it is uh, open protocol, which means you really, you know, you're competing on minor bits of differentiation and service. Uh, do you see like NEC, uh, HP, you know, these companies that are now building open source or otherwise type controllers as being uh, competitive threats, or is it is there all, is the ecosystem so big and the opportunity so big that you're all on the same team essentially? I think the ecosystem is so big. Yeah. I mean, I think the the competition is the status quo. I mean, the competition is hey. You know, how can we cobble together networking technologies that are five, six, seven years old and get them to work for 2,000 VMs per rack? That's the competition. I think all of us that are espousing, hey, there's a new and better way to do things. I mean, will it be competition eventually? Maybe eventually, but not right now. Good. Um, and then from a services perspective, because you know you mentioned you know you come in, you have to do all kinds of stuff. Can you see your company morphing to have a certain percentage being just professional services? Because you know the the Deloitte, etc., the management consultants don't have a clue. You know, it's a really interesting, it's a very interesting and very timely question because we're considering it quite a bit now. We have to do a lot of help with pilots. Yeah. So increasingly, we actually offer professional services work. Yeah. That you'd think of kind of as traditional SC work in a networking yeah. company. We've been surprised how popular it's been. I don't think it'll be a basis for our company. Yeah. But with I think any industry that's going through like this big of a change, I think it just helps. And then as a as an entrepreneur, certainly uh, you know you've got venture cap and those guys are looking for returns. Is there a particular uh, exit strategy or a large larger plan that they've told you you must follow, or is this just a case of build the company and then the good things will happen? Build the company, good things will happen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I give the exact same answer to. Literally to every candidate that's interviewing with us, yeah. I give the exact same answer to, to my family. <laughs> yeah, that kind of believe you have to build a really, really healthy twenty-five million dollar business, and a really healthy fifty million dollar business, and a really healthy hundred million, and a really healthy two hundred million dollar business, a really healthy five hundred. Yeah. I mean, if somebody takes you off that path, they take you off that path. But if you start deviating too far from that path, then you know, it just feels too risky. Is there, as a co-founder, is there a particular uh, challenge? Uh, that's bigger than most that you really have to deal with that you wouldn't have had to deal with in other types of environments? Oh. I mean, every month the challenge is changing. This market is moving so fast at this point that literally every month or two the challenge changes. Yeah. I mean, so ask me again the next month. But, yeah. um, this month literally our biggest challenge is, is just hiring the right people fast enough. I mean it really is. I mean it's uh, I have more people. We have customers that I would kill to get who write and ask for meetings over our website. I, I mean, we have, I have far more opportunities to trial than we have kind of warm bodies to throw at these trials. Uh, so if you ask me what our biggest challenge is right now, it's literally just satisfying trial demand. It's a good problem to have. It's totally different from the problem we had you know, last year where everybody wanted education but nobody actually wanted to install anything. When you started this effort, uh, not that long ago, uh, <laughs> Would you have expected it to be where it is today? Were there any uh, massive surprises that you did not see along the way? When we started this a couple of years ago, I thought this was going to be a wonderful small company. That we had a, we kind of always knew that we had a better mousetrap. I mean, Guido and I have been friends since grad school. Yeah. Uh, we've been, you know, we kind of went out to lunch basically and he started talking about his research and what, he, what his team had, had come up with. I downloaded the open source. Like, we were, yeah. you know, back then it was all Stanford open source. And, Kind of got something working. It was really clear really early this was a better mousetrap. I had no idea that it would become as big as it's becoming. I mean, I thought that we'd find some very, very small niche market that would be really, really interesting and we could build a great little product and a great little company. Uh, and this thing became a much bigger deal and a much bigger vision than I ever would have expected. Uh, we just kind of stumbled our way into a really key problem that, that nobody else seems to be doing a very good job of solving. 
So, I guess that for me was the biggest surprise.